Okay. Well, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the opening of the 2021 International Symposium on Alternatives Assessment. I'm going to keep my remarks brief, but I want to emphasize the important and critical role for this community as we strive to bring forth safer alternatives that can contribute to reducing the stresses we placed on our environment and human health. No greater evidence is before us than the impacts of climate change with its extreme weather patterns from droughts and wildfires to superstorms and flooding. Our community has before it the opportunity to guide the development of the science, tools, and practices that will help to ensure new products entering the market do not pose similar or worse risks for our environment and human health. Our program committee has done an outstanding job preparing an agenda around the theme, accelerating safer and sustainable alternatives. The symposium is designed to highlight critical challenges and needs to move us towards a more effective implementation of alternatives assessment. In that spirit, we are pleased to have the partnership and the support of the Society of Toxicology Risk Assessment Specialty Section for the symposium opening session, where we will hear from esteemed champions of the science. I also want to thank our sponsors, whose generosity has helped to make this symposium possible. We are grateful for their support and we couldn't do it without them. I'd like to now turn it over to Dr. Lauren Hine, co-chair of the A4 Program Committee for her remarks. Thank you, Pam. Welcome everybody, you're in for a real treat this week. I'd like to thank the program committee, slide please, um, who worked hard to bring you both quarterly webinars and this annual workshop. You can find links to previous events on the A4 website. Um, I'd like to call out Elaine Hubble, who uh, connected us with the stellar EPA team who provided the short course yesterday. Thank you, Molly Jacobs, for your inspiration and coordination. And thank you to my brilliant co-chair, Dr. Margaret Whitaker, who volunteers so much time, money, thought leadership, professional connections, writing, and hard work to advance the A4. Next slide. I'd also like to take a moment now to acknowledge a huge loss to the alternatives assessment and pollution prevention community with the current sudden passing of Ken Zarker of the Washington Department of Ecology. I don't know if it's possible to list all of the programs, projects, initiatives, and organizations that happened because of Ken. As in the film, It's a Wonderful Life, Ken played so many roles, both large and small, to advance safer chemicals and to create flagship programs at the state, interstate, and national levels that our community, our state governments, and our national efforts would be very different and far less successful had there not been a Ken Zarker. The A4 will be deciding on how best to create a lasting tribute to Ken in the months to come. His kindness, creativity, and passion for safer chemicals will not be forgotten. And so, on that note, now I would like to turn this uh, session over to Laura Plunkett, who is the president of the Society of Toxicology's Risk Assessment Specialty Section and a partner with Biopolicy Solutions. Laura, thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to say how excited I am as a member of the Risk Assessment Specialty Section and SOT generally. Um, to, to note that uh, we are, uh, we're very interested to become a co-sponsor for this symposium. Also the sustainable chemicals through contemporary toxicology specialty section has also uh, been promoting this. And um, I have a, an interest in this area, even though I haven't done a lot of, a lot of actually uh, work in it. And I look forward to seeing um, the panel talk about the ways that we can look at holistic approaches to integrating design and, ri and risk assessment together to um, solve some of the problems in this area. Thank you. Great, good morning everyone or good afternoon. My name is Joel Tickner. I'm the uh, executive director of the Association for the Advancement of Alternatives Assessment and a professor of environmental health at the University of Massachusetts at Lowell. I'd like to thank you as well on behalf of the A4 for joining us today and 
We have a great treat here um, and a, an honor to have the panel we have coming up. Um, the, we Much of the alternatives assessment community has focused on the safer side of the equation. And as we know, we're moving much faster into as well the sustainable side. So how do we co-optimize safer and sustainable by design and, and integrate that into the tools we use to drive safer, more sustainable chemistry? We have three speakers today who are um, all titans in their field. Um, they're, they're larger than life. I'm, I'm so excited to have them all on a panel um, representing the risk assessment community, the green chemistry community, and the green design and architecture com community. Um, Dr. Joseph Rodericks is the founding principal of Environ and now called Ramble. He is an international expert on toxicology and risk analysis. He's been there since the beginning from the serving on the National Academy panel that led to the Red Book on Risk Assessment, serving on more than 40 National Academy and other committees to build the field of risk assessment and its application um, today. Uh, Dr. John Warner is a um, distinguished research fellow at Zymergen, but more well known for being one of the co-fathers of the field of green chemistry developing the 12 principles of green chemistry, serving as the founder and director of the Warner Babcock Institute for Green Chemistry, and being a leader in green chemistry education. And by the way, about to hear whether he will be the next president of the American Chemical Society. And lastly, uh, William McDonough, one of the best known names globally, or one of the most well-recognized names in sustainability. He's worked with governments, where he's now in Saudi Arabia. He's worked with industry. He's worked with nonprofits to drive a more circular um, and sustainable and safer approach to chemicals, materials, and products um, through his firm, um, McDonough Brown Design Chemistry, or MBDC, as well as other organizations he spawned, like the Cradle to Cradle Innovation Institute. So uh, what we're going to do is start with 10 minutes for each of our speakers, starting with Dr. Rodericks, and then going through having a panel discussion and then opening up to all of you. If you'd like more information on their bios, uh, there's a link in the chat box. Later when we get to discussion, we'd ask you to ask questions in the chat, chat box to keep your mics off and, your, um, and you, muted and your videos off. If you do have a question to put it in this chat or raise your hand. Um, during the discussion, we may ask some of you to turn on your video and to join us in the discussion. So, um, and the session is being recorded and it will be available next week um, or in two months to the public and next week to A4 members. If you're not an A4 member, we ask you to um, join the A4 and to join us in this building budding society, multidisciplinary to drive the evaluation and adoption of safer, more sustainable chemicals. So with that, let me ask uh, Dr. Rodericks to turn on his video and uh, we'll start with your uh, presentation. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, for, <clears throat> thank you for the invitation, Joel, and for that very nice introduction. I'm glad to be here and hope I can say something useful. I'm not in the field of uh, alternatives assessment, I know something about it. I'll, I'll tell you how I got involved in a minute. But I've been working in the field of risk assessment for a long time. I began my career at FDA uh, and then uh, moved into the field uh, fully in the 1980s, was part of this committee at the National Academy that published the report that sort of put in place the risk assessment framework, uh, which is still in place in the United States and uh, federal government and uh, around the country. Uh, this, this little four-step process remains the key note to getting uh, decisions about safety, either the lack thereof or the confirmation of safety. Uh, it's a process that is very uh, uh, information intensive, uh, requires a great skill to carry out. It's slow. It still relies very heavily in the hazard and dose response world on in vivo testing in whole animals and human information, and I'll say more about other uh, uh, approaches that are now becoming uh, a greater part of the process. Uh, the, it's, it's, it's carried out in sort of two different contexts. There, it's carried out in the cases in which there is a requirement under law 
for pre-market approval of substances. Uh, and then there's it's also carried out, and, and that burden, the burden of carrying out the studies, the, the assessment itself very much falls on those who seek pre-market approval of products, chemical, chemical products. And then it's also looked for chemicals that are already out there in commerce, in the environment, in which case the burden of carrying out the studies, uh, carrying out the risk assessment generally falls on the government uh, to show whether there's a risk or not. So, but basic safety decisions are made by this process. It is uh, uh, very uh, data intensive and it's slow. Uh, that's what we rely upon though. And uh, it's primary, primary use up to now is for this purpose. Could it be used as a way to assess alternatives? Yes, it could. In theory, there's no reason why not. You're interested in whether uh, the comparative risks of different alternatives that might be looked at, uh, but getting there uh, requires much more data than we typically have if you're gonna apply this risk assessment framework in every case. Um, ideally, you would, if you had two alternatives to look at, you would wanna see comparable databases on hazard and dose response, even exposure, but the likelihood of that happening is very, very small uh, in any particular case. So other approaches are needed. Let me go to the next slide. I'll talk about something uh, where I learned a bit about this process. Uh, this, this is a framework that I'm, I'm sure is familiar to everyone here. Uh, it's a massive report from the National Academies in 2014. Uh, it's focused entirely on chemical alternatives. I got to know this because I was asked by the Academy to oversee the peer review process of this report. It, it was a very, very intensive peer review process. Um, uh, more members in the did peer review than, were, than there were committee members, actually. Uh, it's a 12-step process to identifying and selecting alternatives, 12 steps. Then there's the final step, which is implementation. And the safer question comes up at step seven. The, the answer to that question comes up under this framework at step seven in the process. There are many steps after that that get into issues of performance and things of that nature. Um, the evaluations leading to step seven are based on, a, I say, adoption of the risk assessment framework. Now, I have to be careful here because the committee does not call it a risk assessment process. Uh, it's different uh, in, in that it's up there to compare uh, risks of different, uh, pro different alternatives. So it's not, but it does borrow from that risk assessment framework I just showed you to look at hazard and exposure as, as a component of the evaluation of safety. Um, it, is the, does, it does differ from the framework, or at least it tries to streamline the framework by heavy reliance on novel approaches to identification of hazards, what have come to be called now in my world, new approach methodology, NAMS, all kinds of interesting systems to get quicker answers uh, on, on chemical toxicity, uh, more, maybe even more reliable, more predictive answers on chemical toxicity. And uh, most, and actually the whole, the whole process was inspired by the need to drop, uh, uh, to, to drop the load that animals bear in the testing process, to rely upon methods that do not require harming animals. So this is making much headway. Uh, that's where the new framework really has to, uh, that's where the new, the new framework here laid out in this process uh, has a heavy emphasis on this. And your field, your field of alternatives is gonna depend very much on this, the development and validation of these new approach methodologies. Um, I will also say this is not the only framework as you all know, and I don't even know if it's the best one. I do know that it, it is very comprehensive. If you tried to go through it, it is highly detailed. I've never seen a National Academy report so comprehensive, so detailed in giving guidance. Uh, there may be others out there that are equally uh, uh, broad in that, in, and equally informative in that sense, but uh, I, I'm just not an expert enough to know what they, where they exist, but you can learn a great deal uh, from this report, even though it's now uh, seven years old. Uh, I think the, the basic ideas 
still remain very solid. I think that's probably uh, takes up my time. Thanks. Great, thank you so much, Joe. Um, so let me introduce uh, Dr. John Warner. Um, and you are up, John, thank you. Oh, thank you, Joel, and thank you to everybody that's organizing this conference to give me an opportunity to speak. I do want to acknowledge the, the loss of Ken. Um, I feel it's, it's super important to recognize how much impact an individual can have in a field. And that while each of us every once in a while gets celebrated for an award or something, it is always uh, a testament to the entire field and to the amazing people that are oftentimes not getting the awards that they should deserve. And Ken has been an amazing individual that has had impact on probably everybody listening to this webinar right now. And it's a reminder of just how precious life is and that when we, you know, we, we talk about saving the world, whatever that means. We also have a responsibility to make the world worth saving. And that's how we treat one another and how we interact with each other. And so I just think it's important to remember how important individuals and people are as human beings in our community. And I will deeply miss Ken. Um, so there's that. Um, you open up the newspaper, you turn on the radio, you look on the internet and you hear about this red dye that causes cancer. You hear about a plasticizer that causes birth defects. You hear about a material that is accumulating in the oceans or a process that is creating global climate change. You say to yourself, why in the world would anybody create one of these technologies? Why would anyone want to do that. And our assumption has to be nobody wants to do it, right? And that it is an unfortunate consequence of the way that we invent technologies today. So if we accept the fact that it's not intentional, then we've got to say, okay, then why, why does it happen? You know, there is no law in science that says that red dyes must cause cancer. Someone invented one that does. There is no law that says molecules that plasticize materials must cause birth defects. Someone invented one that does. And so on and so forth, that there is a discontinuity to the intended purpose of a molecule and the negative impacts are disassociated at some fundamental level. So again, I ask, then why do we do this? And if anyone's heard me talk for the last 25, 30 years, you'll hear that as chemists and material scientists who go to universities around the world to learn our craft, we take a whole lot of classes, we do a lot of research, we publish papers in a lot of high impact factor journals, and then 85% of chemists end up getting jobs in industry and material scientists. Now, once they get into industry and they're asked to go invent the next red dye, go invent the next plasticizer, while they can call on their education to associate what makes a molecule red, what makes a molecule stick in a paint, what makes a molecule not fade, Sadly, most universities, most academic programs, training chemists and material scientists don't have any training on how to anticipate potential negative impacts on human health and the environment of molecular structure. So when we say, let's invent better alternatives, are we giving the people who invent things the skills to enable them to do that? And Paul and Astis and I back in the 1990s recognized that this is that unmet science that is necessary for the field of chemistry and material science. And that is the skills to be able to anticipate these negative impacts on human health and the environment. And that's what we call green chemistry. Right? And it's interesting that in a way, the role of green chemistry is to exhaust people doing alternative assessment by giving them so many alternatives to assess. Right now, I would argue the problem we have is when you do an alternative assessment, more often than not, you come up empty. And you say, well, there isn't any better alternative. And so green chemistry is the mechanism to learn from the alternative assessment where those, those unmet needs are and to address them. 
And so we still have an issue. There's, there's a lot in our investment community that talk about performance of a product, cost of a product, and then those sustainability issues. And I feel we are at a nascent evolution in, in our in time right now in which we are slowly acknowledging that people, consumers, customers, retailers, brand names, when they ask for sustainability, it no longer belongs in the sustainability bucket, but actually it belongs in the performance bucket. If the consumer, if the customer is asking for it, it is an unmet need that we need to address. But again, we go back to, do we train the future chemists, the, the future uh, inventors, the right skill set? And while the nonprofit Beyond Benign, led by Dr. Amy Cannon, is doing amazing work, there are nearly 100 universities that have signed the green chemistry commitment to bring into the curriculum the, the, the principles of green chemistry. There are thousands of universities out there that still need to jump on board. So green chemistry is not about the desire or the need to have these alternatives. It is about the skills to deliver it. Now, use as an analogy, I have a nine-year-old daughter, Natalie. My daughter, Natalie, like all fathers look at their daughters and sons, is amazing and brilliant and beautiful and makes me want to cry when I think about it. But she is so articulate at nine years old. She can carry on a conversation with you better than me. You know, she can read. She can write. She has accomplished a great deal at nine years old. But because of COVID and the way schools have been, interestingly enough, she is just now learning about nouns and verbs and adjectives and adverbs and parts of speech. Now, you might say to yourself, well, wait a minute. Why do we even bother learning about nouns and verbs? I can speak perfectly well, I can read and write and have no idea what a noun is, what a verb is. Isn't that just a waste of time to get into the nitty gritty if, if she's already reading and writing and speaking? Well, I would argue that sadly right now, she is getting by by mimicking people in her environment. She's getting by quite well by adapting to her environment. But when she learns the parts of speech, when she learns the nouns and the verbs and the structure of thought, not only will she be able to communicate better with people outside of her world, but she'll be able to formulate her own thoughts and become that much more uh, accelerated in the things that she can do. And it's a beautiful process. I tell this story because I would argue that the chemical sciences are much like my nine-year-old daughter. Every chemist wakes up in the morning and says, I would rather not expose myself to toxic materials today in the lab. It's a given. People would prefer not to do that. Companies, the really smart ones, figured out a while ago, if you kill your customer, that's very bad for sales. So the desire to make safe products has been there for a while. But like my nine-year-old daughter, the inventors can't go back to when they learned the nouns and the verbs and the adjectives and the adverb, the sentence structure of molecularity on how to design products with a certain rigor, with a certain amount of discipline to do it well. And so you can speak English and not know what a noun and a verb and a, an adjective is, but man, if you learn those parts of speech, it just puts you at a higher level. People can want to invent safe materials, but if they don't have the skills to do that, which the 12 principles of green chemistry provide, there's a lot of want and a lot of hope, but not a lot of ability. And so as we learn from risk assessment, as we learn from, from alternative assessment, as we learn from the things, the, the pioneering spotlight that Bill is shining on the future, and we say, oh my God, if only we had a technology to do this, if only we had a technology to do this, we've got to realize there are many people who passionately want to do it. Many people want to go in the lab and invent this future but they need those nouns, they need those verbs, they need to understand the sentence structure of chemistry to do it well.
And that's our opportunity, is to not look at the different disciplines as if they're separate, but to see how they all overlap and that there's a continuum, K through 12 education, university education, people working in risk assessment, people working in alternative assessment, people working in government, people working shining with, with companies and corporate boards on sustainability. We've got to find a way to better work together and figure out where those gaps are, where those holes are. You know, I'm a full member of the Club of Rome. We're having a meeting right now. I had to step away, for, you know, to, to, to meet with you all. And the thing that I, I, I oftentimes when people do systems maps and chat things out, I feel we need to do this with a great deal of humility because it's not the things we put on the maps that are going to come back to haunt us. It's the things we forget. It's the things we leave out, there's blind spots and we all individually have blind spots and through collaboration and working together, hopefully we can overlap enough to fill those blind spots and see how to do it. The, the next generation of students passionately wanna learn how to do this. Customers and consumers want to have safe and sustainable products, companies wanna make them we have an opportunity to create the infrastructure to make it happen. And so it's, it's, it's just an amazing up time in, in, in existence to, to pull these things together. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, John. And our last, um, and, and as you can hear, just the, 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 the depth, the optimism, the, you know, the focus of our speakers and our last speaker, is going to take even a broader perspective. So uh, Bill McDonough, uh, welcome. And thank you so much for being here from uh, Saudi Arabia today. You're welcome. Can somebody turn on my video? It says I can't do yeah, it. Yeah, you should be able to turn on your video. The button, the start video button should turn it on for you. Yeah, it's not, it says the host uh, has stopped it. Oh, here we go. Let's try that. Got it. There we go. Great. Okay. Wonderful. Hi, everybody. I'm uh, I'm very moved to be here because some of the people I admire most in the world are here with me, and uh, I I had an opportunity to, in here in Saudi Arabia, to work with the kingdom on an idea of taking the circular economy further into the circular carbon economy and start to look at how we think about carbon as an element. And I think this kind of thing is also coming at me because I get to work with chemists. And when I was closing their sustainable initiative here, the Saudi Green Initiative, I ended up speaking with the students and they had just heard their Minister of Energy announced that finally Saudi Arabia is joining the net zero community, finally. And I said, you have such a great opportunity here because you know, John Kennedy announced we were gonna to go to the moon in 10 years, we did it in nine. And when Neil Armstrong stepped on the moon, we had uh, the team from NASA was an average age of 28, which means a lot of these people, probably half had just graduated from high school and they did it in nine years. And so there's so much to do and I, it's hard to imagine. And I, I told them, worry about your discipline a little bit just based on your own bliss, what you love to do, but just remember you're gonna become multidisciplinary. You don't have to know how to do everything yourself. You just have to know that you might need a zoologist in my field, for example, but you're going to need green chemists. That is for sure. So I'm so proud of everybody here and, and the industry for taking this you know, up. And for me, creating Cradle to Cradle with Dr. Michael Brangard, I was looking at this notion of a, a regenerative biosphere of living carbon in a circular type uh, of technosphere of durable goods. And when you look at the idea that we would design things that could go back to natural systems as products of consumption or back to technical systems as products as a service, you start to parse things and then it could, does come down to the molecules. You're dealing with things that are, could be crossing across these two spheres. 
And, and so it was really fun for me to learn about chemistry, mostly from Michael, not a chemist, you know, it'll be abundantly apparent to everyone, but I am really excited about chemistry. And next, please. And so while talking about these things, um, I was asked by Steelcase Corporation, our largest furniture company, to design a fabric and the way it looked, uh, along with four other architects. And they were all famous, and I was in New York, and I was young, and I was excited. And I said, well, can I design what it is also, not just what it looks like? And we ended up working in the mill in Switzerland and working with the chemists. We said no more persistent toxins, bioaccumulative substances, endocrine disruptors, teratogens, carcinogens, mutagens, heavy metals. What if we did that? And we moved the product from 246 chemicals in the production to 38. And when the Swiss inspectors came to test the water, they thought some of their equipment had broken because the fabrics were further filtering Swiss drinking water. The important thing was that the company had to take its trimmings to Spain from Switzerland. They were not allowed to bury or burn it in Switzerland. So it was hazardous waste by definition. And, but you can sell what's in the middle. So the whole thing didn't make any sense. So as John pointed out, was it somebody's intention to make a product that's hazardous waste and then sell the other than the trimmings to, to people? Really, it seems so strange. So I think that strangeness, go ahead, next please. Um, you know, translates across from the biological nutrients that can contaminate the biosphere to the technical ones that can contaminate the technosphere. So working in this case with Berkshire Hathaway and Shaw, we, we cha changed the carpet from PVC with a 9166 face fiber to a thermoplastic polyolefin with a uh, caprolactam based 916 front. And so we could shred it and then thermoplastics get recycled and then the capital act and chemically recycled. And the notion that we stored our raw materials on the customer's floors was very entrancing to Warren Buffett. And if you think about our future, this is the kind of thing we want to do. But at the same time we're doing this, we're also worrying about the chemistry because there's a fundamental question. I was asked to design carpets that were beautiful. Well, how can something be beautiful if it destroys children's health or the environment. I'm a designer. So I started looking hard at that. I started designing buildings like trees and worrying about children and what they were chewing on because they were eating the buildings. Um, next please. And so taking that protocol of biological and technical, we developed a, a five part way of looking at the products and, and in a certification. It was internal, it was private. And we looked at material health first because of the question of how can you make something that destroys children's health and environment. Then the circular economy was second. And, and I am, you know, I was the chair of the circular economy for the World Economic Forum. And, and it did a lot, I've done a lot with that for many years since the nineties in China. But this was about material realization and continuous assets. But remember, things have to be safe and healthy first. Because when I hear a lot of the new circular economy people running around saying, oh, I'm circular, therefore I'm good. But what if your product was toxic in the first place? And now you're recirculating it. You're actually worse. So circular is about quantification, not qualification. So what you do with these assessments is material health assessments is really key and it's the first order of design is how it works in the natural world. So I'm here in, in Saudi because I wanna see clean energy or start of carbon balances and get that carbon out of the atmosphere. So we got a lot to do and it's moving. Well, for we need clean water for every child, every day, it's a human right. And social fairness is critical because we have to share the abundance of the world in a way that's uh, propitious for everyone. So those became the five categories of cradle to cradle certification. We did it internally for our clients, next. And uh, after a while, we realized a lot of people were taking it up in various ways or trying to copy it or, or proposing all kinds of things that we found uh, uh, concerning and, and not enough depth. And we found ourselves getting a, a picture from one of our clients. When somebody asked them, why are you using cradle to cradle? certification 
they sent them this drawing and said, well, there are a lot of certifications, but most of them are single attribute. And this in sustainability, actually, we, we have to measure lots of different things and we have to do a lot of different kinds of products. So this is a broad-based way of looking at things. And so we rely on many other certifications and reviews and standards and so on. But it's a holistic view of product and system uh, and that really mattered. Next. So we look at different things. These are all alternative assessments of various things. And then I, uh, I launched the, the uh, lead program as a courtesy to the US Green Building Council which I was part of funding at the University of Virginia. And uh, so very interested in finally getting a material health point instead of just recycled content points. So when we did that, and they adopted the idea of material health. It was really exciting uh, to see that Cradle Health Certified became one that got two points instead of one point. And it was fun to build on the various things and you know, like, like the green screen, things working with Lauren Hine, uh, who worked with us for, for years. And then we look at these other things that are more simple, that are basic either hazard lists or just simply saying, I don't have something, which I always found strange as a certification. It made me wonder if we shouldn't start a certification called plutonium free or something, uh, but whatever. So, but it was fun to see that this could be taken up at this level of intensity. And we uh, harmonized all the different programs together, working with Google and other people to make sure we could all share this strategy. Next, please. So what I found also in my work with my clients, I work with CEOs, I work with heads of state, I work with um, lots of companies and lots of people and NGOs and small organizations, is that every time I work with the sustainable development goals, I find that these five characteristics of the cradle grant certification, and they're all, they all have their own assessment methodologies, uh, are predicate actually to all 17. So your material health and your green chemistry assessments are predicate to every single one of the 17 sustainable elements. So we work with our clients who are doing that and give them these protocols as the starting point. Next. And there are assessment, hundreds of assessments, thousands of alternative assessments in those charts. So here's what I'm doing here, and I just wanted you to see it. It's a build on our circular economy strategy and biological technical cycles, which has been adopted by people like the Elmer MacArthur Foundation, the Chinese. I mean, we're, we're really, I'm very proud of that. We published Cradle Cradle in China in 2005 as the design of the circular economy. So when you look at this, you realize the main thing I wanted to look at here in this picture is we have our regenerative biosphere, living carbon. We have our circular technosphere, durable carbon, but we've also got our, our fugitive carbon. And that's a problem. And so carbon is not the enemy. It's an innocent element. It's a, a source of life. So we've turned it into a toxin. We did that. And the question was, as John points out, was that our intention? Probably not. But as we look at it, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is by definition a toxin. Right? You know, it's the wrong material, the wrong place, the wrong dose, the wrong duration. And we put it there. It was carbon's fault. We did it. So what we're saying here is instead of allowing carbon to come from the geosphere and go straight to the atmosphere, which it is, and overloading it, we have to stop that. I'm not kidding. We have to stop that. We have to stop thinking of it as a material and a fuel. We have to go to renewables massively. Uh, we have to reduce the carbon in the atmosphere massively. We have to reduce our emissions probably about 60% by 2030. We have to immediately begin to remove carbon emissions from point sources. All the coal fired plants that are still around, you should have their chimneys uh, with, with carbon capture at the very least. For now, as we move away from the coal, we're working on geothermal systems. In China, we have 350 sites where we take out the coal plants and put in geothermal to run district heating systems with the same capex. And, and then ultimately though, we have to do something really amazing and we have no idea how to do it. And it's at the top right. It's we have to remove carbon uh, with technology to meet these goals. That's the dimensions. So this is, all these design strategies here all came from working with chemists. So 
I honor the chemists because I can't be a chemist. I'm not one, I'm not a scientist, but I know I need them. And that's what I love about what being chemistry does and what our assessments do. They signal our intention to have a safe, healthy world with people doing dignified work, the people here. So thank you. Great, thank you. And um, those are great overview um, introductions. So if I could ask our three speakers to turn on their cameras now. Um, we're gonna do about 30 minutes of, or a little bit less of panel discussion and ask you for your questions. So let me just start with a, a, a one that is, uh, you know, this panel is about safe and sustainable, try, trying to, how do we bring those together? I think, uh, Bill, you did a great job um, sort of presenting the cradle to cradle criteria as a way to think about those connections. Um, for, for all three of you, you know, there's a question about how we deal with trade-offs, right? There's no perfectly safe material or perfectly sustainable material. So within, for example, Bill, within the um, cradle to cradle framework. How how do you how do you deal with those trade offs? How do you how are you explicit and then add in cost and performance as a secondary part to that? That's a great question. Well, one of the big issues is um, is context. That it's like John was saying. You don't if you don't have the script and the way to put sentence together. You know, with a lot of the chemicals, they may be hazards in certain conditions and others, they become something that's useful and not hazardous, uh, depending on how they're managed and utilized. So, so I think there's a lot to that. You have to look at things in context and uh, try and understand that. And then I also think using the precautionary principle is very useful in this front, where if we start to see something that has risks that are showing up, and it appears there's another alternative, which also goes back to what John was saying about get the alternatives and make them available to designers. I think that's another element is we have some choices that we can make. So I think that's the main thing we look at. You know, water is highly toxic if you surround yourself with it for six minutes uh, or jump out of an airplane, hit a terminal velocity, you know, very short duration, very big dose. So, you know, I think it context matters. Great. John, do you want to add in there about the question of how you sort of deal with trade-offs? Sure. I um <laughs> I agree hundred percent with 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 Bill. I you know, I tend to be an optimist. I want to say that there is a day in the future where there aren't trade-offs. And that saying, throwing up our hands and saying, oh, we can't get there, that is temporal. That is because of today's level of awareness. There are things we can do and things we can't do. But through ingenuity and invention, tomorrow is not today. And so we, while we have to be realistic and we have to accept the limitations of today, we can never allow that for us to stop moving forward and not dreaming of better ways to do it. So the balance here is that, you know, as a runner, I dream of running the zero minute mile. Well, that's ridiculous. I can't do, but oh my God, if I said I wanted to run an eight minute mile and I did 750, does that mean I'm done? So if I pick zero as my target, my directionality is always set and refusing to accept trade-offs is gotta be the mantra. Recognizing that we are going to have a hard time and it's gonna take us not, you know, decades, but several decades to get there. This is a long journey in front of us. The field of, of chemical sciences, depending on who you subscribe to, Lavoisier 260 years ago, started what we call modern chemistry. Chemistry has only been around for 260 years. What Bill and you and I and everyone else have been talking about have only been here for a couple of decades. We're a snapshot in time yeah. in the history of the chemical enterprises. We need to be patient. We need to be aggressive at the same time. And so for me, I think the point is to never accept compromise, but realize, but also be real, realistic and pragmatic. The enemy of the excellent is the perfect. If I can, and I love 
Bill's comments on the circular economy, that we need to be looking holistically at the big picture. If I have a way of reducing the carcinogenicity of a product and someone says, ah, uh -uh, John, it still uses a lot of energy. Well, tell the mom who just lost their child to cancer that that energy should prevent me from inventing that product. We got to realize that the way science works is through incrementalism. I invent one thing, someone else invents something, someone says, oh, I could put that together and do that. But if we put our hands over our mouths and wait for perfection, it can never, ever happen. We need to build from each other as a community and therefore we need to celebrate every little success. In our community, what happens when someone comes to the forefront and says, I've got something cool, just wait. Three. Everyone starts throwing stones, but what about this? But what about this? And if we do that to these nascent people who want to make it, we're just telling them not to bother. So we need to embrace everyone's efforts and see how we can support each other in what we're trying to do. So yes, we'll never get to zero, but we should never stop trying. Great, thank you. And Joe, where, where does a, a field like risk assessment fit into trying to sort of navigate that direction towards, you know, the perfect, which we know we may never get to, but getting to better. Uh, <clears throat> well, its primary use is to tell you based on evidence, whether or not your product for its particular use is safe. Uh, you know, there are criteria for determining that. Uh, but what's, what, I would point to what Dr. McDonough said about the textile decision back in 1995, I think it was. No carcinogens to be used, no endocrine disruptors, no neurotoxins. So the question at that time might have been, do you really know that these other things that are not found to be carcinogens or neurotoxins, do you really know that they're not that? Have they been adequately tested at that time? that would have required a lot of animal uh, death to test those chemicals. My guess is they probably weren't. It's hard to find, you know, really extensive testing on many chemicals. But what's happened since that time, and I think this also gets to John Wander's comments, the, the field of toxicology upon which risk assessment relies heavily has advanced enormously. There has been a movement toward getting what I refer to in my little presentation as NAMs, shortcut methods that give uh, that do not involve the use of animals, that give perhaps better answers on questions of toxicity than we now get from whole animal studies. We're not there yet, but that is a huge movement. Uh, and, and there's a lot of other things going on. John, we can tell the chemists what to avoid. I think you know the answer to that probably better than I. There's a lot known about chemical structure, physical properties that you want to avoid in construction of molecules. So there's the toxicologists and chemists can work together to work that out. The, the thing that's missing still, though, if someone then wants to commercialize a particular product that you've now made, you think will do a job better and in a safer way, there's still a regulatory requirement to demonstrate safety. And that's where risk assessment comes in. And I hate to say it now, but even now it's pretty data intensive. It takes a lot of resource to get to a good decision about the absence of significant risk in today's regulatory world. That is changing, but it's not real fast. It's changing to rely, as I said, more on these quicker, uh, maybe even more informative methods, uh, but we're not really quite there yet uh, to make full use of them. So I'm not sure that's an answer to your question, yeah, Joel, no, but it's kind of, kind of is. It, it was great. Let me let me follow up on a point that John made, and I want to ask all three of you. Right, as a you know, as a health scientist, I was never trained about design. Luckily, I took you know, I I got training in pollution prevention, and cleaner production, which did, and I met people like John and spent a lot of time with them. But you know, and as John says, most chemists don't ever get any training in toxicology. Most architects don't get any training in sustainability. So. How do we bridge these, you know, what, what are our strategies to bridge these fundamental gaps and silos in the way we design and assess stuff? Um, and maybe I'll start with you, John, about that. You know, what, what's our solution? Well, again, my, you know, my view for what it's worth is that every 
training program for chemists and material scientists should require some content on how to communicate with the toxicology community not to become junior toxicologists, but to be able to have the right language, the right semantics, so that when a chemist is, or a material scientist is working at a company designing the next product, at the very moment they start that process, they're anticipating the impacts on human health and the environment. Now, from a corporate perspective, there's all kinds of, of um, you know, morality here, but it's also just smart business sense because when we get <laughs> to the hurdles of a regulatory, you don't want to, after a company has spent 18 months, 24 months investing in a technology, at that point, have somebody come and say, hey, wait a minute, you can't use that solvent. You can't use that. Not only is it economically a problem, it devastates the, the morale of that organization that the researchers hate the people telling them no. And there's all, so if we could bridge that gap by having the, the scientists and the chemists learn a little bit about that. And that's why at the University of Massachusetts back in 2000, we started the world's first PhD program in green chemistry to take everything that's in a normal chemistry program and add to it a one semester class in environmental mechanisms, add a one semester class in law and policy, add a one semester class in mechanistic toxicology. Now, I don't feel we need that much training. But I think what we do need is that no university should look society in the eye and say, we have just handed all these PhDs to these scientists and sent them out to the world to invent your future. And we didn't think it was necessary to tell them anything about toxicity and impact on the environment. Where's the problem? So if we could start addressing that and making sure that Joe has people to talk to in industry that nobody's talking about when they're inventing stuff, we can start making changes. But if they're speaking different languages, if, then, if he's the enemy and not the facilitator for innovation, we can't break free. Good, let me, let me ask you the same, Joe, to follow on that because mostly what you know, my friends in toxicology do is say how bad everything is. So how do we sort of shift that narrative to? <laughs> Yeah. Well, I'm ready to say something's good as long as there's evidence uh, that it's good. <laughs> so just like any good scientific analysis, you need evidence. And a lot of the evidence right now is very costly and time consuming. I'm just, that's just the fact of life. Uh, we hope that's changing quickly. Um, that, by the way, um, right now, I just want to mention one thing about EPA and the so-called fluorochemical world. They're doing a big review of all of this. And one of their goals is to use these new toxicology methods to kind of prioritize and rank them for regulatory purposes. So they're gonna make some decisions about the value of many of these new, new uh, approach methodologies as they're called. But I'm looking forward to that. Um, but let, let me just say one thing. I, I do a lot of work with small startup companies that are trying to innovate and produce new products. And they have chemists and their chemists know this stuff quite well. They, they have you know, made it a point to understand uh, structural features or physical features to avoid and in designing new products. So it is going on. Maybe you all know this. Uh, so it's not hopeless. I think this, how do you make it a bigger and better enterprise within the academic world? I, I'm, I don't know. Good, thank you, Bill. I mean, what's been your observation sort of going around academia, industry and government on this sort of siloing and how do we address it? Well, I think there are the, there are the quote academic elements to this, which, it, which involves theory and, and involve um, evidence and research and things that are critical. But what I'm seeing is that slowly, thanks to the work of the people here and, and elsewhere, that the notion that something should be safe is really uh, becoming a fundamental right. And so that gets it into the whole thing about society and what, it, what are we doing here? 
know, if you're violating someone's rights to be a healthy person, you know, and then you come back to John's point, which I work with with design all the time, which is the design is the first signal of human intention. So if you're intending to poison somebody, the rhetorical device I use is make people say it. I intend, you know, to put billions of pounds of highly toxic material in the air every year and to pollute <laughs> rivers. And I intend to do this, you know, really? Is that your intention? Because that's what's going on. And once you ask that question rhetorically, uh, people start to, to um, realize that they have an opportunity to, to frame it differently. So what I've noticed, I was looking at the creation of the US Patent Office and the correspondence between Franklin and Jefferson. It's worth reading, it's fascinating because they were trying to figure out what to do about inventions and how they would go out into the world and what to deal with the inventor and the ownership of IP and then what is a trade secret. And they're working this out really it was amazing. And, and Franklin thought everything should be broadcast and published because he was a printer. And Jefferson was trying to figure out how to make sure everybody gets the benefit of it, but that you could multiply the effect and get it out there. So that's where they ended up with, you have to describe what you're doing. So everybody else can work on it um, while you have the 17 years, so the one generation of benefit. So those kinds of discussions are, are really important right now because when we see what's going on in some of the industries I'm working in, you see inspiration, then you see an insight. Let's take Elon Musk, for example. He's so much fun. Uh, you know, he had an insight, let's do electric cars. Okay, right. Plus houses and the rest of it or go to space. I mean, there's a lot going on there, but that was his insight. We need electric cars. For most of us, that would be an insight we can have, but what do we do about it? So the next question becomes intention. His intention is to make electric car, but it's actually not to make electric car. When he was asked when he launched the Model S, what, when did you decide to make the world's best electric car? He said, I never decided to make the world's best electric car. I decided to make the world's best car. And it turned out it's electric. <laughs> but I also decided to make the world's safest car. I also decided to make the world's most powerful car. I also decided to make a car that could go so fast I could call it ludicrous. You know, I mean, like what? And basically he took an iPad and built a car around it where the car people are all trying to put microprocessors and all these various systems in a car. He started with a with a macroprocessor then everything spoke the same language. So his insights were quite phenomenal as he went into implementation, but he also looked at circularity, material flows and chemistry. So it was, it was pretty amazing. Now, when you do that, you end up creating and executing and you create kind of a standard. That's the nice thing about Cradle to Cradle for us. It was a standard, but it was voluntary. It was just people trying their best. Nobody forced us to do it. Nobody said we had to, it wasn't a legal requirement. It's just a thing. And those standards then become policy at some point. And that's why Elon gave up his patents on all the charging systems. It was obvious because now it could become the standard because everybody can use it and build on it. So every time you drive a Tesla somewhere and get charged, well, yes, what a good idea. So sharing all this stuff is really what we have to do as John was saying earlier too. And that's what I see in education is that we share and we share what we share with dignity and grace. And I think that's really critical. So then the policymakers can say, oh, there's a, there's a policy in that standard somewhere. We can do that, you know, 25% recycled content. And then we have to get to them and say, yeah, but the recycled content is toxic. We have other issues, but whatever. But they can go to policy simply. And then we end up with regulation about 10 years later after we try and figure out all the fundamental details. So how quickly can we go through that and how as you just described, how important it is that the intention starts in the right place, you know? Right. And then you don't have to come back and regulate it because there's nothing harmful that we knew was there. And if there is, we'll go fix it. Yeah, I mean, the challenge is then how do you start with that intention and address the incumbency of the existing materials that are out there? I mean thoughts on, you know, what are, what are our biggest barriers, right, um, to achieving this vision? Because, you know, Bill, John, you, you've you presented a big vision that is, you know, as John says, it, it's incremental, but how do we deal with all of the incumbent technologies, processes, materials, and, 
And what's it going to take to tip that scale? You want to start, John, and then we'll go to uh, Bill on that? Yeah. Oh, it's, 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 in, it's interesting. One of the things we've got to realize is that there are some contradictions. And these contradictions sometimes get in our way. And I, I'll always come back to the enemy of the excellent is the perfect. You know, one contradiction is we want to prove that something is safe. Well, technically, you can't ever prove something is safe because by definition, something that is safe is absent of harm. And logic says that you can never prove a negative. You can't say something is absent of harm. There's always another test. There's always. So we as a society have to decide what is enough of a test because we can't do everything. If you say to a company, there are 378 tests you must take, each one of them costing tens of thousands of dollars. So any product is going to require $623 billion to assess. Obviously, everyone's going to laugh at you and you're not going to do it. So we must accept that we can't do everything. Now, who among us gets to pick what we do assess and what we don't assess. So we've got to wrap our hands around the fact that we can't assess everything. So what is it that we do assess? And the second contradiction is that we say industry should prove that their products are safe. It shouldn't be government's job to assess this. It, but Everyone in this community, if a company reports the results of their test, they say, oh, yeah, well, you paid for it. How can we trust it? So, OK, if we're saying that a company should do the testing, but then we say, well, gee whiz, if the company did the, test, the testing, it must be biased. So this is where things like cradle to cradle come into play. This type of having absolute articulate ways of assessing things and then you essentially audit those processes it can move us in the future but at the end of the day if you got 10 people in this room if we broke everyone up into 10 10 groups and we said to each group what are the top five endpoints that we should assess we won't get the same answer. If after we agree on the endpoints, we say, what tests should we use to assess those endpoints? We won't get the same answers. So we need to come together as a community and find a way to collectively do this. There's some work going on in OECD. There's a lot of work going on in REACH. There's some work going on in Tosca. There's a lot of little pockets of it, but there isn't a unified approach. And we need to, and so that's the path forward that we need to come up with. And unfortunately, everyone's gonna find something to get excited about in this unified approach, but everyone's gonna be mad about something because we can't have everything or, because if we have everything, we get nothing because infinity is not attainable. So how do we as a community decide what we, what, how to prioritize? Oh my God, that is not me. I would not want to play God and make these decisions. So how do we do this? Great. Thanks. Yeah. Bill, do you want to comment on the sort of, what do we need to do to make this happen? One of the things I've found is language. Uh, we have to get accurate language. You know, Joe pointed out, we have to have, you know, science at work here. We also need language at work. So one of the strange things that I see in my work is so many people talking about end of life. And I understand life cycle assessment. I understand the protocols. I understand it's science. I understand it's source to disposition. I understand that. But when everybody keeps talking about end of life, they end up talking about in the circular economy, when something meets its end of, reaches its end of life, these are typically inanimate objects. And we're putting this human projection on them. And it's not a living thing. And so most of that stuff is really a product as a service, we call it. It's something you want the utility, right? right? But you don't need to own the molecules, you want the use. You want to wash clothes, not own rubber, aluminum, steel, whatever. So if the companies can continuously own the materials, they actually have to be able to keep it on their books. They can actually depreciate stock and they got their raw materials available for them and you get to clean clothes. Now, then you start to think about all those materials. What are they? And how would you really want to hold on to them? Are they the right ones? And 
you can make them quite precisely and delightfully if you're going to reuse. So we don't say end of life in our design work. We say end of use. And if you say end of use, then it begs the question, what's the next use? Which begs the question, designing for next use. That's what we do. So we design for next use. So I have buildings designed for disassembly. We just changed all the glues and the cross laminated timber. It took me five years working with Henkel. We got it done. So that it's a dignified piece of material, uh, uh, you know, with a, ready for its next use. And so that really, I think, is a big part of this. And the language is part of what lets you understand what we're trying to accomplish. So I think safe and healthy, then circular, et cetera, is really important. I also think there's this idea of if we have things that we like and we've tested really thoroughly to Joe's earlier point, how many materials were there? We looked at 8,000 chemicals that first round with Siva Gaigi. They, they helped us. And we were able to go ahead and dig in. And we quickly uh, got it down to about 250 because some of them just weren't needed, period. But they were using about 250 chemicals there. And by getting it down to 38, to that point you're making earlier, we didn't have to do deep dives on 250 things. We did deep <laughs> dives on 38 things. And yeah. uh, you know that really helps. And if you design for next use in the polymer industry, we have way too many plastics. You know, in biology, we love diversity. We, you know, we need six thousand types of birds and four hundred kinds of French cheese, but we do not need six thousand kinds of plastic. So, we it becomes incoherent at a certain point. So that's another issue. And then you got a few ringers, like in the packaging industry, we're, and in chemical recycling, we're very unable to really process PVC. Mm -hmm because it messes up everything <laughs> and um, so stuff like that. So once you get to the other end of the system, trying to reuse it and play, create dignified futures for everybody, some of those things are just don't belong in the dignified future because they make you use stainless steel equipment when you can't afford it, et cetera. Great. So. Uh, Joe, I'm gonna ask you a last question and then we're gonna take questions from the audience. Um, you know, you were involved in designing the the, the four-step framework for a risk assessment, which arguably is much simpler than the 14-step alternatives assessment guidance, but um, from 1983. What can you tell us about the growth of the field of risk assessment that can inform a nascent field like alternatives with assessment, which is multidisciplinary, um, global, and, and and growing as a field, right? It's it's really, you know, we're, we're only three years out from a National Academy report and trying to find our way as a field that can help guide the design, adoption, assessment of better alternatives. Yeah, so let me, uh, I'll try to answer that question fully, but uh, one point I would make in, in response to what John said, I don't think the safety system, the system for defining safety is quite so bleak <laughs> as you described, John. The, you know, there is a lot of guidance on how one goes about making decisions about safety based on uh, what kind and the kinds of evidence needed to you to make those decisions. Guidance from the National Academy of Sciences put into place by agencies like EPA or OSHA or FDA as well. Uh, it, you can disagree with many components of it, but there is a system. It's not, it's not uh, just sort of random. Uh, so there are criteria for what constitute safety for a chemical. Uh, not everybody will agree with them. That's one issue that comes up in uh, all discussions of this issue. Th there is scientific disagreement and that has to be uh, dealt with. Not everybody agree agrees that uh, endocrine disruptors are, are necessarily bad at the exposures uh, we ordinarily encounter. So guidance, I trust a lot in guidance from the National Academy. Those committees are quite well informed. I don't know what, I don't think we can do better than that. Um, and, and so the movement toward uh, getting better data more quickly without harming animals is all inspired by National Academy work. So I, I place a lot of trust in what they do and, and the, I, I don't know how we can get better guidance on many of the questions, not every question, but many of the questions we're dealing with here. Uh, I'm not sure that was a full answer to your question, Joel. But yeah. Well, that's, well that's tell me a little bit. About it. Yeah, tell me a little bit more about the history of risk assessment and how it's you know it's 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 the way we assess for the most part chemical risks, right? So yeah, it started it, it started with carcinogen. You know, so the 
<laughs> my first involvement with uh, alternatives, I, I, when I was at FDA, I was involved in the review of a ton of information that had come in on the, the artificial sweetener saccharin in the 70s and showing it to be a bladder carcinogen in rats. And under the law, it's the only law I know of, which is totally hazard based. It's called the Delaney Clause to the Food Additives Amendment. Um, it came in in the 1950s. And it said, if a substance is a carcinogen, it cannot be added to food in any amount. Uh, that's an absolute ban on such a material. But saccharin was highly desired by many people. And so there was a lot of controversy about that decision at FDA. Um, there were a lot of controversies evolving at that time in the 70s about carcinogens in general. No safe level was the mantra. There was no, no, you could not tolerate any exposure, but there were, the regulators knew lots of unavoidable exposures in the environment, not readily avoidable. Uh, chemicals had, you know, moved out into the, into the environment in major ways that you just couldn't, you, you couldn't just ban them. So that called for some kind of approach to looking at risk and hoping you could at least force levels down to levels of risk that are very low. Um, you may not call those safe, but it, that's where it arose. And that approach to risk assessment developed by the regulatory agencies was the subject of a review by the National Academy that resulted in the Red Book uh, that said, we, you know, this, we need to involve a risk-based process. Many of our laws require it. And so that's how there's a long history of this uh, that it culminated in that report in 83. That report, by the way, is pretty narrow in scope. It doesn't carry, doesn't cover a lot of the questions you guys have raised here today, but it focuses entirely on how do we say something about risk and how do we distinguish that risk assessment process from decisions about what to do about it. Uh, and then it's grown from then. There are, there are another 20 Academy reports, all focused on improvements in the risk assessment process. Only one on the alternatives question that I know of, the one that I, I mentioned in my little presentation. So it, it's, a, it's a complicated, but it's a very rich history. It's still evolving. Great. Thank you, Joe. John, let me, let me ask you about sort of your lessons from the history of uh, green chemistry. How do you grow a field? You know, what, what, what does it take? And then I'm gonna ask you a second question that came from the audience, which is, how do we think about persistence? Is persistence sort of the thing we want to avoid on its own uh, when we think about a chemical? And you know, how do you think about that at the design phase? So two questions there. Well, actually we could combine them and, and say, how do we grow a field persistently? But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but um, growing a field, you know, again, I tip my hat to the work that you have done in your team and the Green Chemistry and Commerce Council, the work that Amy Cannon is doing and Beyond Benign. And so the field is growing. You know, people like me who are pathologically impatient want things to go faster, but is measurable progress and things are happening. And it is about communities and respecting different perspectives and pulling that together. So so I I'm more see myself, you know, astounded by the work people are doing growing this field. As far as persistence is considered, concerned, I actually, in, interestingly enough, I'm going to answer it from a different perspective. We live in a massively polarized world now. Everything has to be polar. You're either A or B, you're this, you're that, us, them. Everybody has to have camps. And one of the camps that I see getting uh, evolving now is are you into recycling or are you into biodegradation? And somehow you have to pick one of those camps. And of course, there isn't a dichotomy. Yes, we want materials that are non-persistent, that are degradable, and that are recyclable. Or if it is persistent, make sure that it's maximalized or something. And so these questions are not simple two minute elevator pitches. They're a little bit more complex. So persistence in some contexts is a good if they're well controlled and com contained and non-toxic. If something is persistent and non-toxic and recycled, that is good. If something is persistent and hazardous and dangerous, that is not so good. And so persistence in and of itself. Now, I do feel if things are accumulating in biological systems, I don't feel 
this is just my own personal thing. So don't take this as anything bigger than John Warner's personal opinion. Something is bioaccumulating in, into organisms. I'm not so, I don't think it's so important to prove that there's some deleterious effect. It don't belong there and it shouldn't be there. And we should be doing things to not let that happen. So I don't feel we have to prove harm for persistence if it's accumulating in ecosystems and biological organisms. Just it seems that the precautionary principle suggests just because today's level of awareness can't find something wrong with it doesn't mean if it doesn't belong there, it doesn't belong there. And so that's just my personal opinion. Um, and that follows on what Barry Commoner used to say, which is if you put something in the environment and sticks around long enough, it's surely going to cause something bad to happen. So, you know, um, so Bill, let me ask you the same question. Um, about this sort of, how do you build a field? You know, what's the strategy here to build a field like alternatives assessment? You've been so successful in building all of these organizations. Is there, is there a secret to it? Are there specific strategies we should be thinking about? And then I have a follow on for you, which is, you know, you mentioned PVC, just it's gotta go. And um, in Europe now there's this concept coming into the chemical strategy of essential uses. And are there just, is there just stuff that's going to have to go for us to reach safety and sustainability? I know it's a multi-part <laughs> question. That's a big question. <laughs> I know. <laughs> He's on mute. I think Bill's on mute. Yeah, you're muted, Bill. You got to hit that unmute button. This there is really go. embarrassing. Okay. Oh, don't worry. Yeah. It's, we're a year into COVID and everyone <sighs> does it still. So don't worry. <laughs> yeah. But um, I think the getting everybody involved does involve a uh, kind of opportunity for joy. I think this whole thing we talked about misery. I think there's an opportunity for joy here. Mm -hmm. um, I'm tackling one right now that I'm really enjoying. I'm really terrified that I won't be able to do it, but we'll see if it works. And it has to do with the uh, sachets and the redesign of sachets. And we're studying on compostable packaging what we can use for design. And we're discovering all kinds of magical things because we intend to use paper as a base. And, and we have to get the cost so low that we have to be able to make the paper locally. We're not shipping paper from brazil or something you know we can't do that we have things products that are one rupee you know and and we have to figure that out so we're finding ways to pulp agricultural secondaries without high temperatures which is really amazing so we can keep the lignin and we can use the lignin because it doesn't burn and just amazing things we're discovering just in this chore of discovery this little course of discovery the other is trying to figure out what are the barrier properties and how we're going to achieve them for various kinds of content. And then you discover that the content and the package are really one system. And we see that in Cradle to Cradle too. So we study with Cradle to Cradle, is there any migration from the package into the content and vice versa? And so now all of a sudden the content has to be biodegradable. And we don't even know what biodegradable is anymore. With oxodegradable things coming into the world and the jurisdictions going uh, you know, different directions over it, Europeans saying no, and um, so we're looking at compostable all the way to hydrogen, carbon, oxygen, you know, without microplastics, even nanoplastics. We're hearing about the fish in the deep ocean coming up and, and we're finding nanoplastics in their brains and they, they're, they're actually penetrating the blood brain barrier. So that's actually being used by cancer researchers to figure out how to treat cancer with being able to penetrate blood brain barriers. It's like, you know, I don't know. So. I think people really would love to be able to, to get involved in that kind of thing. Um, so it, you watch the chemists who rise to this occasion. It's quite beautiful, frankly. So it's a, it's a mission. It's a mission to planet Earth. We come in peace. So Let me ask you the second part there about whether this, this concept of essentiality as we start thinking about, you know, products, materials, chemicals, um, are, uh, you know, yeah. it, it, you know how, do, how do we start thinking about that? Because it, it, it could quickly devolve into something that's very subjective, like 
who needs this when yeah. others might say, yeah. yeah, I do actually. Yeah. Well, I think that PVC is a good example for this one because if, if we, we need sanitation and you know, the things we really worry about with PVC, depending on what, you know, monomers you use is, is getting burned. It's a real issue. Um, and, and then plus trying to recycle it is, is really tough as part of another system because we got hydrochloric acid. So, so, but on the other hand, do we want PVC pipes under the ground to make sure we have good sanitation affordably? That may be an essential service. And if we can see that the risk, et cetera, and the utility, et cetera, all start to make sense. You know, we have to rely on our scientists to help us understand what to do. Because not having water could be deadly. <laughs> So to toxic absence. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, Joe, let me, let me ask you a question. There's a critique of, as I mentioned this earlier, um, there's a critique of risk assessment is often being used as a tool to, uh, that leads to paralysis by analysis that slows down action. And how do we, in the alternative assessment world as well, avoid that really where we're we're using the science to make the best decisions that protect health, but drive innovation as well. And, and what have you learned from some of these long discussions um, that could help improve our alternatives assessment processes? Well, I've already mentioned it. The most important thing to me is finding better ways to uncover toxicology information mm -hmm. faster without harming animals, more relevant to humans as well. There's a huge amount of work going on in that world. Uh, and I have faith that it's gonna all yield something very beneficial, but I don't see a way out of our mess uh, with dealing with, you know, we've got 4,000 fluorochemicals to deal with that are now out in the environment. How did that happen? What was all the design thinking that went into the creation of those compounds? I don't know if they're essential, but they have many, many, you know, very, very, what manufacturers think are very valuable uses. Uh, so how do, how do we get there? Uh, there must be some lessons in that. Everyone knew that the, floor, the carbon fluorine bond is the strongest bond in all of organic chemistry. Why did, why did chemists devote so much time to making heavily fluorinated compounds? They had great important uses, but now we've got a, quite a mess to deal with. So anyway, I, my faith is in uh, science and improving our methods. I don't see another way to get information that is very, very badly needed without having these sort of, sort of very short-term tests that are validated in some way uh, for purposes of determining ultimate determinations about safety. Uh, we may be another 10 years away from that, but I think that is the goal. I don't see another way to it. Great, thank you so much, Joe. So we're gonna, we're reaching the end of our time. I'm gonna give each of you just a, a minute to wrap up based on the conversation you've heard today. You know, where are, where are our greatest opportunities moving forward as a community of practitioners, academics, um, you know, regulators we have on this call, you know, to really move this idea of um, safe and sustainable chemistry and materials forward. So I'll start with you, John. Well, again, I am filled with optimism. I think that, you know, we're, we're in a tough spot because when we talk about the problems, it gets pretty depressing. And it's, you know, but the getting rid of those problems should be seen as being profoundly optimistic. Um, and as Bill has pointed out, the next generation just gets this and understands this uh, and wants passionately to, to play a role in this. So I, I, I feel that we spend a lot of time believing that the case must be made. We need to explain to people. And I think we need to start saying, okay, let's just assume the case is made and get on with doing stuff. Um, because if we, if it's almost as if it works against us, if we say the case has to be made, then that suggests that maybe we shouldn't be doing it. And so my, my final closing thought is that it's now 2021, soon to be 2022. There are going to be people who are never going to come around. There are people that are going to be resistant to this. 
but there are way more people that want to be part of this journey that want to do this and if we're focusing on the people that are saying no and not helping people who are saying yes we're looking in the wrong direction and so let's roll up our sleeves and with a great deal of optimism put our arms around the people that want to make this all happen and let's just do it great thank you so much sean bill i'll build on that I think we found seven kinds of people we deal with <clears throat> in our work. And the first are called total enthusiasts. They're usually younger, just the kind of people John's talking about. They're all excited. They go, wow, look what you do. Look, I want to do that. I want to do better than you. You know, we just want to do that. Great, 100%. That's my new career. Um, those are ones. Twos are people who go, I love what I'm doing, and I like to do it this way. That's really exciting. I'm on board. Let's go. Threes are people who go, ooh, this looks like a better quality way to work. I think I'd like to do that, you know, and I don't think it's going to disrupt my job. Fours are people who go, well, I'll do whatever they want, you know, and I just assume keep my job. And if they want me to do it like this, I'll do it like this. And I'm not unhappy because it's better. And then you got fives so as people say, I just wait until I can retire and, and get my pension. So I'll do whatever they ask me to. So I'm fine. You know, I'll do it. I don't care anymore. Then you got the sixes. They're the dangerous ones. They're the deep sixers. They're the passive aggressives. They're the incumbents. And we call them the mules sometimes, just for the fun of it. And they're positionally conservative. They don't want to move. They're very powerful. And they're mules. Now, there are characteristics of mules. One is you never want to try and teach a mule how to play a violin. It sounds terrible, and the mules don't like it. So do not try to teach the mule silence. Right? That's one thing. Don't waste your time. And the second thing is, you got to remember they're sterile, okay? They can't reproduce. So, so you've either got to come up with a way to move them, you know, and that can either be a stick and usually a big one, or what I like to do is create carrots big enough to use as sticks, you know, <laughs> whack them over the head with opportunity. And then that works a lot, but otherwise just ignore them and go around them because they can't reproduce. So they're one generation. So write them off and get back to work. And so just move right past them. But then you ever bump into the sevens and the sevens are really something. They're the active aggressives. See, the sixes don't send the memo. They forget to give you an idea. They don't help you move. They're passive aggressive. But the sevens are active aggressives and they're the best. They are so much fun because you get to joust with them. And, and they're really smart and they really know what they're doing. And when they come over to our side, it's gorgeous. You know, so we really like the sevens. <laughs> so that's how I look at it. So just go have fun <laughs> and treat everybody with respect and yeah. do your work and put down your tools and go home and love your family. Great. Thank you. That's wonderful. Uh, Joe. Yeah, I can't say anything better than I just heard from these two guys. So <laughs> that was great. But uh, to me, I, I still have faith in regulation as a key to much of this. And the regulators, you know, they're very bureaucratic. They get caught in all kinds of uh, bureaucratic streams that they have to get out of, but they should have more power. The laws are pretty powerful in this country and they just need really strong enforcement. So that's one thing I have, uh, uh, I'm not sure I have faith in it, but that's one area where I would emphasize that you know, much, much benefit can still come from that. Um, the, the other area is what's clear from this discussion here is the need for uh, cross-disciplinary action in this area. That's, it's stronger than you know, almost anything else I can think of in any area that I'm familiar with. Um, so I don't know how that happens. Uh, it usually begins in an academic setting, I suppose, but there may be other mechanisms to try to bring that about in some way. Um, so, yeah, I don't see how the field moves very swiftly anyway without that kind of cross-disciplinary action. Great. Wow. What a, what a great panel. Um, I am so, uh, yeah, I'm so honored to have spent the last hour and a half with the three of you. Um, it's, it's, I, it gives me hope for the world um, that we have such brilliant people protecting us, designing getting folks to adopt the materials of the future as um, my mentor, Mary O'Brien, I teach environmental health and I teach a group of students about all the problems we have. And I said, well, 
it doesn't do anything to just focus on problems, right? That just gets people locked up. We need to focus on solutions. And as my mentor, Mary O'Brien, once said, following what Bill said, is if we figured out how to put people on the moon in nine years, we can figure out how to make materials, chemicals, materials, and products that don't harm our health. And I think that's right. And as Bill sort of ended, right, this should be fun. As um, one of uh, my old friends, John O'Connor, an environmental activist, said, uh, the fun is in the fight. And this is a, a fight for, you know, the future. And um, we look forward to working with all of you and doing that. So um, thank you again. Um, best of luck, John Warner, on your ACS presidency. We hope that we hear good news in five minutes. Um, so uh, we are going to ask everyone to um, uh, drop off now. We will be coming back in a, a half an hour for the next panel. Um, we have a 30 minute break to go grab lunch, dinner, breakfast, and look forward to joining you for more in-depth presentations about this nexus between safe and sustainable alternatives. And again, thank you all for joining. Really enjoyed the presentation. So thank you, John, Joe, and Bill for spending an hour and a half with us. So. Thank you, Joel. Thank yeah. you all. Thanks. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.